Hope you've had an opportunity to have some lunch. If you haven't uh, grabbed dessert already, maybe we can do that and reconvene as people are drifting back in. Let me thank you again for, uh, for joining us for lunch and for this afternoon's program. As lunch continues, we're actually very privileged to have the Honourable Mr. Justice John Hedigan from the High Court in Dublin, Ireland, to offer us some reflections on an international perspective in what is otherwise a fairly domestic day um, with at least a North American flavor. Justice Hedigan was educated at Belvedere College, Trinity College Dublin and King's Inns. He was called to the Bar of Ireland in 1976, to the Bar of England and Wales through Middle Temple in 1986, and to the Bar of New South Wales in 1993. And so forth, and therefore he is actually an international judge in and of himself. Um, he was sold, called to senior counsel in 1990, and he practiced largely in administrative, constitutional, and commercial law. But significant for our purposes, he was elected in 1998 as a judge of the European Court of Human Rights by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. So he himself has sat as an elected judge. We had some discussion last night about that process and the way that things changed at the European Court when that transition took place there. He served from 1998 in that capacity until his appointment in 2007 by the President of Ireland to the High Court of Ireland. On the European Court of Human Rights, Judge Hedigan was Vice President of the Third Section, Chair of the Committee on the Status and Conditions of Judges, Information Technology and Languages. He also sat on the Rules Committee and the Library Committee. And on the High Court in Ireland, Judge Hedigan currently works on the Judicial Review side. And we've invited him to talk more today in terms of a personal reflection on his experience at Strasbourg, which we've labeled, I've taken a bit of liberty in terms of topics and labels, 47 countries, one tradition, or one legal tradition. And actually, in terms of trying to confront some of these issues of bias, national tradition, expectations of representation as opposed to fiduciary arrangements, we can think of nobody better joining us this weekend than Judge Hedigan to have uh, direct personal reflection on that experience and to tell us from his perspective how you actually bring all of those traditions together. Judge Hedigan, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for uh, addressing us today. Well, uh, thank you very much, Professor Payton. Thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure for me to be uh, back here in, um, in Sacramento again. I can't remember if it was four or five years that I was last here, but I had a most enjoyable visit here then, and it's wonderful to be back here again. I suppose you could say that the title for my uh, short address today is And Now for Something Completely Different. Uh, because I must say, I think the morning's uh, uh, session has been, for me anyway, absolutely fascinating. Many of the problems addressed are, are ones that are identifiable both at a national level in Ireland and uh, in, in a continental sense in, uh, in, in Europe. I suppose I should also uh, begin by completely dissociating myself from the comments of uh, my fellow countryman Richard <laughs> Devlin, <laughs> who uh, committed this frightful heresy of saying that the Irish are to blame. <laughs> I would like to point out that I think he probably made a slip of the tongue. In fact, as you know perfectly well, it's the English who are to blame for everything. <laughs> Now, there, uh, there also occurs to me, uh, starting off here today and looking out at uh, all these people from such a different background, the story of the, um, uh, the senior counsel who uh, uh, appears before the judges of the appeal court and who opened his uh, case by saying, uh, for the existence of an enforceable contract, there must be offer and acceptance, consideration, and an intention to form legal relations. The presiding judge, a little bit nettled by this rather pedantic start, said, Mr. Murphy, you may assume this court is familiar with the basics of the law of contract. Swift came the bitter response, that judge was the mistake I made in the lower court. <laughs> So it's uh, always important to have some sense of uh, who it is you are actually uh, talking to. And in that sense, I'm completely innocent. Uh, 
I will be talking very broadly about the experience that I had in eight years in Strasbourg on the European Court of Human Rights. I know that there are a number of people here who are actually quite expert and well informed on what that court is and what it's all about. So I would crave your indulgence if you will allow me perhaps to throw, thrust this at a slightly lower level than that because I think there is no conceivable reason why people in California should have uh, much of a knowledge of the European Court of Human Rights, and yet it is in its own way a kind of judicial miracle that is worth uh, knowing something about. So what actually is it? The first thing is that it is not an EU court. You would be forgiven for thinking it was, because in Europe, at least 50% of the time, it is mistakenly described by those who should know better as an EU court. It is not a court of the European Union. It is a Council of Europe court. The Council of Europe was set up in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War to try to defend human rights and democracy. The experience of the Europeans, and indeed of the whole world, uh, through the Second World War was that human rights could essentially not be protected on a national basis, because at moments of supreme crisis, governments were likely to reach for the nearest and the most uh, effective uh, weapon to try to protect themselves, and we can see that reaching all the way across the, uh, the, the, the decades uh, since. So the feeling was that, uh, that uh, human rights could only be defended at international level, and that is that governments would actually police each other. It's ironic that the original idea of the Court of Human Rights was that actually all cases would be taken by states against other states, saying that they were not complying with their treaty obligations, that is, the European Convention on Human Rights. But in fact, uh, as time developed, what transpired was a system in which individuals sued their governments before the European Court of Human Rights and thus developed the uh, right of individual petition which lies at the very heart of the whole of the uh, convention protection uh, system. Prior to uh, reforms that occurred as a result of which I ended up in Strasbourg called Protocol 11, there was a, a pre-existing system that I won't uh, bore you with. After it, there was the system that existed up until a few weeks ago. There has now been a further uh, refinement, and again, I'm not going into the details of that. I want to be quite general here today. Suffice it to say that in 1998, uh, the uh, new Court of Human Rights was set up. The previous one was abolished together with the previous commission. The functions of both were put together into one single court that sat uh, permanently in the city of Strasbourg in France. Uh, how did I get there? Well, I suppose the first question really in that regard is, how did a nice thing like that happen to a guy like me? <laughs> well, my background was, as, uh, as uh, Professor Patience pointed out, as a uh, an advocate in Ireland. Our system is very similar to the British. We have barristers and solicitors. I was a barrister. And I practiced for a long time in administrative, constitutional, commercial law. In our system, because it's such a small market, a barrister has to be able to do quite a lot of different things. There isn't a sufficiently large market, or there wasn't anyway, in my early days to support you if you specialized in one thing. I had always had a very deep interest in issues concerning civil rights and human rights, and indeed the truth of the matter is that my initial interest in uh, civil rights uh, arose directly out of the American civil rights movement. At that time I was very heavily involved in debating in Belvedere College in Dublin, which is a very famous debating school, uh, a school with a very famous debating uh, tradition, I should say. And uh, one of the main issues then, it was 1964, was the Civil Rights Act. And though at, uh, at that time, our TV uh, news programs were full of images from various parts of America of difficulties that were encountered in the civil rights movement. So it was from that, really, that my initial interest uh, grew uh, in the whole matter of uh, human rights. And uh, when I finally went to university, I joined there, or in fact myself and a few others, refounded a branch of Amnesty International, and we worked on behalf of uh, different prisoners while we were there. When the Court of Human Rights was about to be reformed in the late 1990s, uh, my uh, 
my hope really was that uh, uh, if there, there was a favourable wind and a friendly Attorney General in office that I might get to be briefed in the cases before the European Court of Human Rights. But in fact, as things turned out, in 1998, the government decided to advertise uh, for the post of judge in the new European Court of Human Rights. They were obliged to submit a list of three names to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe who would choose from the list of three. For the first time ever, the government advertised a judicial position. And uh, I applied, I suppose, more with uh, hope than expectation. But as things ended up, I came I was put onto the list of three. I think the wind was favourable, and as it happened, the Attorney General did know me quite well and knew my interests. So it was, as these things frequently are, more luck, I think, than anything else. <clears throat> I ended up on a list of three, which was submitted to the Council of Europe, and here we move into the election process. Uh, your description here today of the election system in America is not, in fact, new to me. I attended a conference in Brandeis University organized by the Brandeis Institute on just this very topic, and I remember some extremely interesting accounts of the Alabama election system, which was referred to here today. And in that regard, I've just spent a few days' holidays in Chicago, and I had a very interesting experience when I was uh, uh, visiting a place in Lincoln Park uh, there, and I spotted across the road a, a poster for election, and I, it probably was an old one because it was the only one knocking around. And uh, I was struck particularly by it because it said, Flanagan, judge. <laughs> so I had to cross the road, obviously. And when I got to the bottom, I saw that, interestingly enough, in tiny writing at the bottom was Democrat, which says something as well. <laughs> but I looked more closely, and I saw that it gave you an address to contact, www.tomflanaganjudge.com. And this certainly fascinated me, as uh, it would any European, because the concept is so strange to us. By the way, if any of you come from Lincoln Park, please remember my uh, good friend Tom Flanagan. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, it seems strange to most Europeans. And indeed, it is very strange to them when, uh, when people talk about me as having been the judge appointed in Strasbourg and it amuses me to correct them and to say, well, actually, I'm elected, or I was elected, because so few European, in fact, I think we're the only European judges that uh, are actually uh, elected. The international tribunals have their own UN election system. In any event, uh, myself and two colleagues appeared in Paris before the a special ad hoc committee of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe to be interviewed by them in a system that they like to think is partly based upon the United States Senate. Mind you, you only have half an hour to make your case, which is a little bit different, but I suspect that people like Judge Bork would have preferred a half hour hearing rather than the lengthy one they did have. We shall see what transpires with the successor to uh, Judge Stevens, whose departure I'm, uh, I'm glad to hear that he's made a decision to, to finally to move, but I'm sorry to see him go. Uh, I think he has a stature as, uh, which is uh, of the highest level at international level, and I wish him well in his uh, very well-deserved retirement. <clears throat> at any rate, after what might be described as a fairly perfunctory sort of uh, interview process, the Parliamentary Assembly, which incidentally consists of members of Parliament from all 47 countries, or 42 then in fact, 41 in fact I think, uh, of the Council of Europe countries, and uh, as it happened they elected, they, they, the committee recommended me and subsequently the Parliamentary Assembly, as invariably happened, uh, okayed the decision of the, the committee and so I was elected. This, of course, was an amazing change for me. For a start at the beginning of the year, I hadn't really thought that this uh, might uh, actually occur. Uh, I was a practitioner, like most barristers. I spent the first five years of my practice practically starving. I had hardly any money. If it wasn't for my wife, I don't think I'd have been able to even go out in the evenings at times. <laughs> times were so tough. Uh, so once you get established, you're very slow to, uh, to give up what uh, you've managed to achieve. And I suspect it's quite similar in, uh, in the legal profession here in California, too. Not everyone is a zillionaire. 
Uh, so it was a completely new way of life. Now, one of the uh, interesting things about moving to Strasbourg, and one of the things that made it rather easy, was that Strasbourg must be one of the most beautiful little cities in Europe, if not indeed in the world. It's a Roman city originally. It's now French, although all the signs are in German as well. It, in fact, is picked by Winston Churchill as the ideal site of the Council of Europe because of its history of being thrown between the Romans and, uh, sorry, between the Germans and the French. And indeed, it dates from the time of uh, Charlemagne when he uh, gave, divided his, after his death, his empire up and his son Lothar got this particular area, which was called Lothar Ingia, which has now changed to Lorraine. And uh, so it is a history that goes back a very long way. There is a town near Strasbourg which exemplifies that, I think, very well. The central square was for many years called Place Royale. Uh, it then became Place de la République. It was then changed to Otto Bismarck Platz. <laughs> it then returned after the First World War to Place de la République. It then, in 1939, became Adolf, Adolf Hitler Platz and it's now back again to Place de la République. So these are people who've had to put up with a lot and who know how to blow or to bend with, uh, with the wind. Uh, one of the interesting things about being in Strasbourg, of course, is the language situation that, you, uh, that, that one has. Uh, English was not very widely spoken. It's either German or French. I didn't have very much German, and my French was a little bit... Uh, a little bit rusty. So one of the interesting problems that you have as an international judge is to start to brush up on your French because you have to work 50% of the time in it. I found that a very interesting challenge and I must say one of the things that I uh, greatly appreciated from my time there was the ability to at least uh, be able to order a meal properly in a restaurant in French if nothing else. I thought I'd just share with you under two different headings and very briefly what I consider to be the highlights of the time that I was there. The first heading would be case law and the second would be more of the administrative side. The uh, case law uh, highlights that, that, uh, that I experienced while I was there was the uh, second only interstate case at that stage that had ever been taken. The first one was Ireland versus the UK, which is a very famous case and sets out many different, uh, very important legal principles in relation to uh, inhuman and degrading uh, treatment. The second one was the case of uh, Turkey versus uh, Cyprus versus Turkey, and that involved the, uh, in the consequences of the invasion of the island of uh, Cyprus. Uh, the uh, facts of that case are far too complex to go into here, but suffice it to say that uh, the, some of the issues that arose in that, mat in that particular case involved extraterritorial jurisdiction. Why would Turkey be responsible for uh, events occurring in Cyprus? The court ultimately decided in a case that's interesting because there would have been parallels, for instance, had America, uh, the US, been part of the Council of Europe, uh, seen uh, um, had that pamphlet not been published way back then, if the British had succeeded in uh, suppressing it like apparently Washington wants to do now, that uh, uh, the, 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 the facts of the case were that the uh, Turks had invaded, uh, they had taken over, uh, but they nonetheless said it's not within our jurisdiction. Uh, Turkey is our jurisdiction. The court held that control was the deciding factor. By virtue of the presence of uh, a, a very large uh, force of, uh, of armed forces on the island of uh, Cyprus, the so-called, they declared, uh, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, uh, that they were within, that anything that happened was within the jurisdiction of Turkey. And that meant that Turkey was obliged under Article 1 of the Convention to secure to all persons within their jurisdiction the rights contained in that Convention, which meant they were responsible. This led to a further difficult decision by the court in that case, which is still debated to this day. I was the judge rapporteur in that case, and uh, I still to this day consider that the decision that we made was the correct one, but it was a decision that arose out of the obligation you'll be familiar with 
uh, in international law for parties to exhaust their domestic remedies before they come to an international court. In short, the national state has the right to sort out any problems within its own jurisdiction before an international court can come in. In that particular case, the issue arose because uh, Greek Cypriots were uh, obliged, it, it, the Turks said in their case, and the court agreed with them, to use the courts which the Turks had set up in the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus before they could come to the court in Strasbourg. This, of course, is very difficult for them because it was an affirmation of the invasion and the uh, jurisdiction of the Turks, something they bitterly opposed. The court decided they did have to apply to these courts largely because the convention obliged those who were in uh, uh, subject to the convention to secure to all persons within their jurisdiction the, uh, the rights contained in the convention. One of the most important of those was the right of access to courts, to have courts. If the convention insisted that you do this, then when people uh, came along and said, we will not go to those courts, how can you criticize the government? The government is obliged to set up courts so that people will have their rights protected. Therefore, the court, it was felt, had to go along with that. And it was a very difficult decision, and it's criticized very severely to this day. Other issues that arose uh, in cases that followed, and it may give you a sort of a, a slight picture of uh, how wide the, the role of the Court of Human Rights is, was in the Bankovic case, which involved the bombing of the television station in uh, Yugoslavia by the, uh, by the NATO forces. And there it was held in that case that uh, the, uh, the, the NATO forces, those countries who were subject to the convention, uh, did not have control in the area, which had been alleged, because all that they had was aerial control of the super, uh, uh, the, the super incumbent column of airspace over uh, Budapest, and in fact they were subject to anti-aircraft fire. And I think further the court felt that you would not secure the rights of persons within, nor could you, within such an area by dropping bombs on them. So it was held that the control didn't exist. Lastly, in the case of Bosphorus Air versus Ireland, uh, the issue of the relationship between the court in Strasbourg and the court in Luxembourg was dealt with at some considerable length. In fact, in that case, uh, I, I think that the number of uh, meetings of the drafting committee of the judgment for the judgment was larger than in any other case in which I was involved in all the time that I was in Strasbourg. Essentially, it found that there is a kind of rebuttable presumption that the European Union is in conformity with the Convention and provides equivalent protection, but that it is open to you, obviously, to rebut that presumption. On the administrative side, we had highlights such as being one of the uh, countries at the cutting edge of uh, technology in the management of a colossal caseload. Uh, we ended up finally with, uh, in that respect, with a, a, a system for broadcasting on the web the public hearings of the court. And to this day, if you wish to have a look at uh, the Council of Europe site, when you get into the court's uh, site, you will see uh, webcasts, and you can just zap on that, and up will come a list of all the most recent webcasts, including today's case, if there was one today. And when you zap on that, you will get the full broadcast of the entire case, which will always last less than two hours, more often than not, just an hour. And I'm also very happy to say that at the bottom of the screen you will see a little sign which says that the webcasting project is financed by the Government of Ireland. It was a contribution made by Ireland Aid. But uh, I said earlier that Protocol 14 has just come into effect and is reforming the court. I'm not going to bore you with the details here today. I doubt if you'd remember them anyway, and certainly I might not even remember most of them. Uh, many people are very hopeful that it will help the court to get through a colossal caseload. There is a backlog at the moment of 100,000 cases awaiting a hearing. It's impossible that this could ever be dealt with. Ways of trying to deal with it is something that needs to be considered with some, uh, with some care. I have my doubts as to whether Protocol 14 will really succeed at all, but the, I guess one has to just uh, keep on trying. However, to conclude, because I think I'm just coming to the end of my time, uh, the 
overall reminiscence that I have of Strasbourg is not just about these arcane, albeit very interesting, concepts such as extraterritorial jurisdiction, sovereign immunity, the exhaustion of domestic remedies, or other things. It's more about people. And in that sense, the uh, webcasting project was, uh, I thought, one of the best developments that we had. Because I must say, I had in my own head a vision of uh, some Russian uh, peasants in the middle of the steppe able to go to the nearest library to see on the internet their government being brought to book before an international court. And in fairness to the Russians, who've created a number of problems for the, the court, the fact is they are there and have agreed to be subject to it. They don't agree with everything the court does. But that in itself is a great leap of faith on, on their part. As far as the people's element cons is concerned in it, I'd like to just tell you two little stories. Uh, the first was the concerns, almost the very first case that I ever dealt with in Strasbourg. And it concerned a, a lady who was in her mid-80s in the city of Warsaw. And she, her, her complaint was framed in a way that's actually quite common in the Strasbourg setup. It was just a letter, Dear Court of Human Rights. She complained she couldn't get a phone. And she couldn't apply to anywhere because they were giving her the runaround. And she had no access to a court to do anything. So we discussed this very briefly, our particular section. The court is divided into five sections, each one a sovereign court. We couldn't do anything. There's no convention right to a telephone, unfortunately. <laughs> but we did feel so kind of moved by this little letter that we asked the registrar of the section to write to the Polish government, uh, enclosing a copy of the letter, and to ask them for their comments. And about six weeks later, the registrar at the beginning of our meeting, read us a letter that had just arrived that day. Dear Court of Human Rights, my phone arrived this morning. <laughs> and she went on to express her great delight that there was now an international court to which you could apply if you needed a telephone. <laughs> and so we were... We were very touched by this because it gave us a sense of uh, behind all of this very elaborate law and this massive international system that had been set up, there were actually little old ears somewhere trying to get a phone. The last case has always stuck in my mind, uh, the case of uh, Marius Popoff versus an Eastern European state, which will remain nameless. Poor old Popoff was uh, on his night out, and he probably had maybe a second vodka. Anyway, things got a little out of hand, and wherever he was, the cops were called. And things took a turn for the further worse when Popov tried to explain to the police how stupid they were and how uh, he should be allowed to go free. He was, in any event, uh, subjected to, he alleged, a very considerable degree of violence, and he was hauled off to the local police station and charged with all sorts of things. So he came to Strasbourg and he had complaints about bodily integrity, about uh, his uh, right uh, not to be subject to inhuman and degrading treatment and just about anything else he could think of. But I always do recollect his final summation of his highly complex submissions at the very end in which he simply stated 80 pounds of pop-off subdued by 350 pounds of police. <laughs> Justy Hedigan, thank you very much indeed. I saw um, a look of some relief on a few judges with administrative responsibilities that they now have a wonderful comparison to make anytime anybody complains about backlogs in their courts. Um, in, in that respect, we, I had suggested at 1.30 that we would go to the, uh, the broadcast, but if there are uh, any, we'll, ta we'll take a couple of questions for Justi Justice Hedigan if, if there are any. Okay, seeing none, then let me actually try and get the technology to work. <laughs>